I looked up at the presidential box above the stage where Abe Lincoln had been sitting the night he was shot and felt a curious sensation. I thought that even with all the Secret Service protection we now had, it was probably still possible for someone who had enough determination to get close enough to the president to shoot him. Ronald Reagan You're watching History Hound Strange Motives Four presidents have been successfully assassinated in this country's history. Abraham Lincoln, James A. Garfield, William McKinley, and John F. Kennedy. In addition to that, there have been two assassination attempts that left the president injured, Teddy Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. Every one of those stories is interesting, and in the coming years, I feel confident that we will talk about all of them. Today, we're going to discuss the most recent one, the attempt on Ronald. Reagan. On March 30th, 1981, President Reagan was speaking to an AFL-CIO on luncheon being held at the Washington Hilton Hotel, which was a very familiar hotel to the Secret Service as they used it for over a hundred events leading up to this day. In fact, the hotel has an underground tunnel constructed after the death of Kennedy named the President's Walk, designed specifically with the President's safety in mind. Despite this, the location of the tunnel is public knowledge, and has and he was greeted by press and citizens on his way into the hotel via with the via the president's walk at one forty five. He gave his speech and left through the tunnel at two twenty seven and headed towards his limousine passing by a crowd of reporters. Moments before he got into the car, six shots rang out. The first shot hit White House Press Secretary James Brady in, directly in the head. The second shot hit DC Police Officer Thomas Delonte in the neck as he reacted to the first shot to find the shooter. The third shot missed, but many experts believe that it only missed due to the quick thinking actions of Agent Jerry Parr, who after hearing the first shot immediately grabbed the president and dove into the car. In concert, Agent Tim McCarthy got between the shooter and the car, spread his body out to make himself the target. The net shot hit him in the chest. The fifth shot hit the bulletproof glass on the limo, but the last shot hit the frame of the limo, ricocheting off and hitting the president under the arm, puncturing the lung and miraculously stopping less than an inch from his heart. This entire endeavor took just under two seconds. At the same time, a labor officer from Cleveland named Alfred Antonucci happened to be standing next to the shooter and hit him in the head and tried to wrestle the assailant to the ground. He was joined by another Cleveland labor official named Frank McInerma and Secretary Service Agent um, Dennis McCarthy that the would-be assassin had been subdued. The president was rushed to George Washington University Hospital, where he was in surprisingly good spirits, despite being near death. He had lost a lot of blood, but was prepped and ready for surgery in under 30 minutes. He joked before going under anesthetic that he hoped all the doctors were Republicans. The surgery was a success. The three agents who were shot also underwent surgery, and all of them survived the ordeal. There was some very severe long-term effects. McCarthy fully recovered and Delahanty recovered, but suffered extensive nerve damage on his left arm. Brady, however, did not fare as well. He would be particularly paralyzed and wheelchair-bound for the rest of his life. Even still, he would remain Reagan's press secretary for the remaining of his administration. Brady would go on to be an advocate for gun control, and with Reagan's support, would be instrumental in getting the Brady Bill passed in 1993, which increased background checks and instituted a five-day waiting period in the purchase of firearms. So, who is the guy who tried to kill the president? 
What political zealot or KGB agent had Reagan in his sights? Surely he must have opposed some crucial policy that was passed, or maybe he was a member of a clandestine group looking to overthrow the president, or maybe it was this guy. Meet John Hinckley Jr., student and Jodie Foster superfan. That might be putting it lightly. In 1976, Martin Scorsese released his classic movie, Taxi Driver, where Robert De Niro plays a taxi driver who plots to assassinate a presidential candidate. Jodie Foster played a 12-year-old victim of sex trafficking, and Hinckley was obsessed with this film. When Foster registered for Yale University, he moved to New Haven, Connecticut to stalk her, repeatedly calling her and slipping weird poems on her door. He decided that he needed to get her attention by engaging in a grand gesture. He considered hijacking an airplane, but thought that assassinating a political figure would be the way to go. So he set his sights on Jimmy Carter. And he was close. He was arrested in Nashville on a firearms charge at the Nashville airport where Carter had a campaign stop. The FBI did not deem that the charge was related to the president's visit and did not alert the Secret Service. Hinckley would change his target to the newly elected Reagan in a couple of days before the attempt when he was in Washington en route to try to woo Jodie Foster with creepiness. He noticed Reagan's schedule in the Washington Post and thought that instead of stalking this week, he was going to try and get her attention by killing the president. Surely she would notice him now. Thinking he would likely die in the attempt, he wrote her a note saying that she must notice him now, and all of this could have been avoided if she just let, if she just lived the rest of her life with him. The rest is history. Well, not quite. Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was sentenced to a mental hospital. He was released in 2016 to the care of his mother, where he had to adhere to a strict regime of no alcohol, drugs, violent movies, or contacting Jodie Foster. He was to be reassessed 18 months later. To this day, that reassessment has not happened. The mass outrage over the verdict would ultimately lead to revisions on how insanity pleas work, including three states abolishing the defense completely. So, what did we learn today? Simple. We learned that if you want to gain the affection of an actor or actress from a movie you're obsessed with, Trying to assassinate the president is not a very effective way to convey this affection. Maybe try nothing at all. But more to the point, beyond celebrity obsession, if you're trying to win the heart of somebody you are infatuated with, and they tell you no, then they told you no. There is no asterisk or conditional clause there. Move on. Lest your infatuation turns into obsession, and that obsession turns to violence. You've been watching History Hound. I'll see you in history.